Welcome to the Career Now podcast. I'm your host, Jed Lee Henry, and on today's show, we have Donald Baker. Don is a professor of Korean history and civilization at the University of British Columbia, and he's got a lifetime of work under his belt building up ideas, context, and the history of religion in South Korea. Now, primarily, he is a scholar of the Chosun dynasty, and this is a very important starting point here, because at this time, through the polls that we have, Korea was a very irreligious country at least when it came to official designation of religion, or officially recognizing yourself as belonging to a certain religion. Now this of course begins to change of the period of Japanese colonization, and even then, at the end of the Second World War, religion in South Korea struggles to find its feet. It's held back by a number of factors. The traditional religions inside South Korea were often looked at as backward and as belonging to an older era, and the country in many ways was swallowed up and focused on what they saw to be a communist threat from North Korea. But eventually, of course, it begins to grow and begins to find its feet. And it does so push forward on the ideas and the changes brought about by Protestantism. Now, Catholicism was the first Christian religion to find its way onto the peninsula. And of course, there's a deep history of Confucianism, Buddhism, and of native religions such as Tongha. But none of these had the impact that Protestantism did because in many ways, it was a religion that competed on market forces. It had ideas built into it and its proselytizing and outreach and missionary work that made it incredibly competitive in this space of religiosity. In one of Don's articles, he refers to this as the religious marketplace in South Korea. And this is a wonderful term and wonderful way to look at what has actually happened on the ground throughout these years, to look at the fight and the competition for followers and architecture and resources. And this all speaks to a dramatic change inside South Korea. One of the earliest polls that we have on the religious landscape across South Korea comes from the Japanese. And in 1916, they counted approximately half a million Koreans who designated themselves as either Christian, Buddhist, Shinto, or another form of Korean indigenous religion. That was half a million out of 17 million Koreans. And yet Gallup polls today, when run across South Korea, show that about half the population of the country is now religious. The shift here needs some explaining. It's moved from about 4% of the population to 50% of the population. And it hasn't spread out evenly. Traditional indigenous religions haven't fared that well. Confucianism is still struggling today and in many ways has lost its identity. One Buddhism is struggling to find a place within the shadow of its broader Buddhist larger brother. Tong Hak and other indigenous religions still sit on the fringes. And central to this is Catholicism, Protestant Christianity, and Buddhism, which dominates fairly equal shares of that 50%. Which, of course, interestingly, leaves another 50% of the country as non-religiously affiliated, which poses another question in itself. Has this religious marketplace bottomed out? Has it hit an invisible wall of market saturation? There are so many important questions here. And so much explaining to do. And from here on out, I'm going to let Don do it himself. He, of course, does a much better job than I do. But below the podcast, I'm going to link the articles that I use as research here. They come from a much broader body of work of his. And I do encourage listeners to go and buy and read them for themselves. They are not just histories of religion in South Korea, but histories of the Chosun dynasty. And importantly, in this podcast, what we're going to get to is histories of modernization, of democracy, and also of the Gwangju uprising, for whom Don himself was an eyewitness on the ground, and through which religion played an important role in the movement itself and in the persecution. I have listened to people talk about the Gwangju uprising before and their particular personal experience, but I haven't quite heard it in the terms that Don does in this podcast. The emotion and the detail and just how he takes you there is worth the listen in itself. Now, as always, this podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. So if you do want it to continue, please consider supporting the podcast directly at the PayPal or the Patreon link attached below. Failing that, you can always share, like, or comment on the podcast across social media. All the help in this regard is greatly appreciated. On that, and to walk us through the religious marketplace in South Korea, this is Don Baker. Don Baker, welcome to the Korean Now podcast. Thanks for having me. So today we're going to be speaking about the religious landscape inside South Korea and uh, importantly how Christianity has, inf- has really affected some of these important movements inside South Korea. So I might start 
you've done a whole lifetimes of work based on this issue. There's so much detail out there. I could almost, I was struggling to find uh, how, how much I could get myself to. It was a real effort here. So I might start with a ground in here, and this is an interesting place. You write in one of your articles, you say in a, two, in a 2012 report from the Ministry of Culture, Sports and, and Tourism in South Korea, a 286-page report on the religious environment inside South Korea came out and they speak about a religious supermarket or a religious, or a religious marketplace. And this is an odd term for many people. So what exactly does that mean and uh, what exactly uh, do you mean by it when you speak about it in your research? What I mean by that is Korea is almost unique in the world in the diversity of religions. You don't have one dominant religion there. You have Protestant Christians making up about 20% of the population. Catholics are about 9 or 10%. Buddhists are about, depends on who you're talking to, 15 to 23%. And then you have, of course, shamans. You have many new religions. And so what you have, or instead of one religion being dominant, you have different religions all competing with each other trying to gain more adherence. And it's mainly dominated by the three religions, of course, Christianity um, and, and, and the Protestant and Catholic versions and uh, Buddhism. But there are other many other religious communities out there, and they've all picked up on the notion of proselytizing. They're all trying to bring in converts. And you see proselytizing around the world, but you don't see the different religions as evenly matched in, as, you, in, as you see in Korea. Even in Singapore, uh, which is relatively religious diverse, you don't have the... The, the Buddhist and the Christians don't come that close in their shares of the national population that you see in Korea. So from that as well, this marketplace seems to have been a rapid growth, at least in this uh, last century or so. So that is quite an important point here, this idea that uh, you write in the, at least during the Japanese colonial period when they started doing these stats, it was a incredibly low degree of people who openly confessed to being re re religious. Now, that may be a problem of simply terminology or how they define their own faith, but by the end of the century or where we are now, that has dramatically changed. So how do we explain what has happened here and why this has grown so dramatically? I think there are a couple of ways it's, it's changed. First of all, you're right in saying it's partly terminological. Koreans before the 20th century, were religious. But they wouldn't have called themselves religious. They went to Buddhist temples. They did Confucian rituals. They went to shamans for rituals. And the same person would do all three. They wouldn't see any problem with going to a Buddhist temple in the morning, a Confucian ritual at noon, and going and seeing a shaman that evening. Uh, but Christianity introduced the notion that you are a member of a specific religious community and that you call yourself a member of that community. I would argue that in the Chosun dynasty, which ended in 1910, the only people who called themselves Buddhists were Buddhist monks and nuns. Uh, only people who called themselves Confucians were the Confucian scholars. Okay. Um, and of course, shamans were called shamans by other people, but they would call themselves various things. So that's shamans, a derogatory term. But the average person didn't see themselves as wearing a religious label, but Christians came in and did that. Christians wanted to say, we're Christians, we don't go to Buddhist temples, we don't go to shamans, we don't do Confucian rituals. And that created the notion of religious affiliation. So as more and more people in Korea started calling themselves, uh, as, as say, Christians, other people said, then what am I? Oh, I must be Buddhist. Right? And yes. so you notice the interesting phenomena. As the number of people who call themselves Christians grows, so does the number of people who call themselves Buddhist. I don't think that means a higher percentage of the population are going to Buddhist temples. I just means a higher percentage are calling themselves Buddhist. So there's another important step in this, which I found quite fascinating coming to your research here, and that is the idea of this co this competitive marketplace and how it all comes about and the role of ethnicity. And you're right, in many countries, uh, because there's so much different ethnicity inside different countries, people automatically tend to associate my ethnicity with this religion. But Korea, as you write, is 98% ethnically Korean and it's homogenous in this way. And you say that in some ways this uh, opens up the space, this competitive landscape, this uh, deeply uh, competitive, capitalistic almost environment. That's exactly right. Because I'm thinking about other countries in Asia, like in Malaysia, if you are a Malay, you are a Muslim. <laughs> that's, that's by definition. Yes. Uh, and, and of course, in Burma, if you're a Burmese, you're Buddhist. Right. Well, obviously, Korea is not that way. In Japan, it's kind of assumed that if you're Japanese, you go to the Shinto shrine. You wouldn't call yourself a Shintoist, but that's part of being Japanese. You go up and buy a Shinto shrine for certain times of the year, certain um, periods in your life development. 
Uh, but in Korea, there really is no religion that people say, this makes me Korean. You know, you can be a good Korean Christian, a good Korean Buddhist, you can be a Korean Confucian, you can join the new religions, and you're still Korean. And that does make it more competitive, because people people don't have to worry about, say, um, abandoning their own ethnicity when they join another religion in Korea. It's because they're not connected. That's very that's unusual in most of the world. One change, by the way, has come since I wrote that article. There are, there are Muslims in Korea, and Muslims in Korea used to be primarily Korean converts. But over the last 10 or 15 years, as more and more uh, Muslim workers have come to Korea to work in the factories, uh, Islam in Korea has changed to being seen as a religion for people from outside Korea. The, the Korean Muslims themselves have felt they've been marginalized in the mosque in Korea. But otherwise, there, there are no ethnic d- identities for religions in Korea. Uh, so on a similar topic there, this idea, this uh, uh, marketplace so you mentioned here, and this is interesting, this terminology that you use, it's really quite fascinating. And this is the idea that you talk about the, the, the clerics or the proselytizers as salespeople. So all the terminology here is around the marketplace. And you talk about the, the dramatic rise inside the country. Now, this is an odd phenomenon because you write, interestingly, I'll give you, I'll, I'll quote from you here. Uh, we can ask if McDonald's sells as many hamburgers as it does, because, uh, we can ask if does does McDonald's sell as many hamburgers as it does simply because there are more restaurants or because more people prefer the hamburgers? And this is an interesting point here because you're right, there's been a dramatic rise in the number of these religious salespeople inside South Korea. So how do you try to delineate this? Do you see the the rise of these new religions and, and religion itself coming about because of these people or these people following the wave in a sense? I said coming out because Christianity introduced the notion of proselytizing, particularly Protestant Christianity. Buddhist monks in the Chosun period did not try to convert people to Buddhism. They kind of, well, Buddhism was marginalized. They kind of hid out in the mountain temples. Um, Confucians didn't try to proselytize. It was just sort of what you did if you were a member of the upper class. You were, if you're a man, you were a Confucian. But first Catholics and then Protestants particularly came to Korea to convert people to their particular version of religion particularly Protestants, uh, very quickly, there are a lot more Protestant proselytizers than there were Catholic or Buddhist. Now, I'm talking about people out there, pastors, not only preaching in churches, but having their, their parishioners go door to door trying to convert people. I, you know, I, when you live in Korea, you know, people on the streets handing out pamphlets come to my church. Uh, that started with Christianity. There's a wonderful book by a guy named um, Mark Nathan um, uh, about proselytizing and Buddhism in Korea, how the Buddhists realized they had to start copying the Christians because they were falling behind. So they started creating these kind of pogyoso, which are proselytizing centers in cities in Korea to try to get people to come to the Buddhist temples. And so this whole idea that you proselytize is new. And the average person probably wouldn't think ordinarily, especially if they live in a village, about joining a religion until somebody knocked on their door and said, why don't you come to my church this weekend or my temple and see what's going on? Um, now, it's not only proselytizing, it's also the rapid urbanization of Korea. Korea has incredibly rapid urbanization. In 1960, only about 25% of South Koreans lived in communities of larger than 50,000 or so. And now look at Korea today. Not only is it over 90% urban, 40 to 50% of the population live in the Seoul area. And what happens when you move to a city like that? You... Um, you don't know anybody. In your village, you know people. I mean, it's kind of assumed you go to the shaman, you go to the local temple, you come to the city, especially to Seoul, and you're lost. You don't know what to do. And pretty soon, in the old days, maybe it's calmed down a little bit now, in the 80s and 90s, you move into a nice high-rise condo, and somebody's going to knock on your door and say, you're new in town. Why don't you come to my church? Okay? And you're lonely, so you do. Um, and then you become a Christian. And then Buddhists have started trying something similar, too. So, it's the combination of the growth of proselytizing, of preaching, of trying to bring people into churches and temples with the loneliness of urban environments that has created this upswell in people who identify with particular religious communities and has created this competitive marketplace. How, how important in that picture is the growth of um, architecture as well? Because as you mentioned, I do live in Korea and used to live here, of course, for quite a long time. And there is a dramatic rise. The amount of churches inside the country is quite large. But you write importantly here about how it, the architecture really has taken off around the place. And uh, it was part of the growth of Protestantism and that kind of and that aspect of the faith that 
it grew from uh, this dramatic rise in architecture in some ways as well. And even the um, when you talk about uh, Catholicism and why it's lagged behind, perhaps some of this has come about because it hasn't it hasn't built the same kind of diverse architecture across the country. Well, the Catholicism has the problem that their their clerics have to be celibate, so they don't attract as many. There's about a little over 5,000 Catholic priests in Korea now. There are maybe 70 or 80,000 Protestant pastors, and a lot of pastors want to have their own church. So there are over three times as many Protestant churches in Korea as there are Buddhist temples, for example. And, and again, there's only about four 4,000 Catholic parish churches. So um, what you have, if you walk around Seoul, particularly, Busan's different, you walk around Seoul, you will see churches everywhere. And it's not just churches competing with non-Christian religions, they're competing with each other. The different denomin- within denominations even, each pastor wants to have the biggest church in the neighborhood. And so they build these very impressive looking um, complexes and you can't miss them. It, you can see Buddhist temples around the cities, but it's harder to find them. But the churches, particularly the Protestant churches, are visible everywhere. And again, people who aren't religious may get curious. They may stop in to see what it's all about. And somebody will greet them very warmly and start telling them what they believe and practice there and what the benefits are of being a Christian. And pretty soon they're a Christian. That's how it works. So the visible evidence, it's like advertising, right? They're putting up their signs there, these huge um, churches. And also the churches, because they're some of them are so huge, they are a sign of what? Of wealth, prosperity. What are Koreans all about in the last half century? Pursuing prosperity. And the churches have been a visible sign of prosperity. So you mentioned two things there that I want to touch on. The first is the growth of those mega churches and this competition for uh, not just parishioners, but also for funds as well. And you write that this in some ways in your you put you put through your research here that this has, of course, blurred the lines a little bit in this this rapid growth in religious in religious institutions. But it's also began to blur the lines between um, uh, personal and public wealth, or at least the wealth of the church and the wealth of the leaders of the of the church and you put some examples here but there seems to have been a few ex- key examples of fraud and corruption that have led from this in recent years that's right it's sometimes it's very difficult to separate the personal income of the pastor and the income of his church when korea has an unusual phenomena when a pastor gets older and ready to retire he sells his church and he sells not just a building he sells it along with access to the congregation i don't see that in north america <laughs> that's quite amazing um, and so and we have had very um, public instances of, of church corruption. The, what calls itself the largest church in the world, the Yoida Sinfokum Full Gospel Holiness Church in Seoul, claims to have a congregation of 700,000 to 800,000. The founder was accused by elders from his own church of redirecting funds that were supposed to go for the church into his own pocket. And he was actually convicted in court for that. And so that's, that's, a, that's a particularly um, well-known instance of this kind of corruption. Uh, but a lot of Korean Christians are upset about this. A lot of the, the seminary professors uh, complain about this. And not all Christian pastors do this, of course. Uh, but these mega churches are often guilty of that. And I often say that, first of all, Korean Christians choose their church, not by the church that's in their neighborhood, but by the, the, the pastor. And they want to go to a pastor who's famous and, and make him their pastor. And they will travel halfway all the way across town uh, to go to a church uh, that has a famous pastor. And then they'll tithe. Uh, Korean Protestants believe they have to pay 10 percent of whatever they take in every month to their church. And I've often said that um, all I need are 100 millionaires going to my church and I've got a pretty good income. <laughs> right? Yes. So I'm not saying it's a racket. Cause a lot of these pastors use that money to feed the poor, to carry out proselytizing, what they believe is very important, to build educational institutions and so on. Um, but you do see church building is really powerful in Korea. They want to have a bigger church than the one next door. And they will steal believers from a church down the road that's a member of the same denomination to get them to come to their church. And they do it, um, first of all, I've seen cases where people want to be an elder. If you're a man in a Korean Protestant church, you want to be an elder. That's a position of respect for a lay person. I've seen people quit their church because the pastor's not making them elder to go to find a pastor who will name them an elder. 
Okay. Um, so there's a lot of that competitiveness going on, even within the denominations in Korea. You don't see that so much in the Catholic Church because the Catholic priests don't own their churches. They get moved around by their bishops. Right? So that is the second point I was actually going to bring up there, this uh, this uh, hierarchy inside Catholicism. You write that the, the competitive marketplace is just not there because I, I there seems to be a single hierarchy within the country and a single structure. That's right. You've got the cardinal and you got under him bishops. And again, priests are moved around. In fact, if they fear that a, a priest is beginning to identify his particular parish as his parish too closely, the bishop might move him because they don't want that. Um, and so and, and obviously a priest is not going to be able to sell his church <laughs> when he retires. Mm. And, and so it's quite different. Whereas basically Protestant pastors are, on, are spiritual entrepreneurs. They're, they're out there trying to build. They call, they call it church planting. They're trying to build a congregation. And the congregation will, will do tithing, give them the money they build. They need to build a bigger church. And that's what they're all about. Now, Catholic priests also want to build a bigger church. Uh, but that church they know will not be theirs, but will be passed on to whoever replaces them in that parish. As, a Buddhism is kind of in between. Um, Buddhism doesn't have quite the same kind of rigid hierarchy that you see in Catholicism. And there are some entrepreneurial Buddhists, for example, the monk who founded uh, what's called Nungen Sunlon in, in, in southern Seoul, the Kangnam area. Um, and he he built up his congregation, his Buddhist congregation, by going beyond what Buddhist temples usually do. He has um, he calls it a Buddhist college to teach Buddhist doctrines to what they call posalim, um, the middle aged women believers. And he also has social welfare activities and so on. Uh, but uh, so he's kind of loosely affiliated with the dominant order, Joge. Um, so it's his te- it's his temple, but it's still he doesn't have any children that will inherit it. If, when he retires, he won't sell it. <laughs> so it's not quite mm-hmm. the same as what you see in the Protestant churches. So on a, a similar note here, and this is this is interesting. I'm not sure what you put this down to, but uh, you write that despite a lot of the world being engulfed and the Catholic Church being engulfed by um, sex abuse scandals in at least recent decades, you write this has not occurred inside uh, um, South Korea. When I wrote that, that was the case. There have been now a couple of cases of priests who've been accused of sexual abuse of, of parishioners. In one case, it was a priest who'd been a missionary in Africa, and that's where he was accused of, of sexual abuse in Africa. But it's still rare. And I think the reason is the Korean, there are a lot more priests than there are parishes in Korea. So priests are not alone. <laughs> they 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 work with fellow priests in the same parish, meaning, meaning they live together in, in the, the priest residence. And so they don't have the same kind of freedom <laughs> to be alone. Uh, with mm. Christians. So it, it doesn't happen as much. Um, I think it, it might also be possibly that Koreans really respect their priests. Um, they, you don't call a, in Korea, you never call the priest by his given by his personal name. He's always just call him priest. By the way, same thing with Christian Protestant pastors, you don't call them by their personal name. Whereas in North America, we call Father Jim, Father Paul, or whatever. And um, that's nice that people feel that like close to their priest, but also means they also don't feel as bad if they have to report them for something <laughs> because they, yes. they feel like they're not on a pedestal. And But I really do think because of the way the priests in Korea don't have the kind of privacy that they often have in North America with the shortage of priests, the, that priests in Korea aren't as able to engage in the kind of sexual shenanigans that you see in North America. So let's step into the question of Christianity in Korea, and later on we'll get to Buddhism and Confucianism and some other of, and and some other important uh, faiths across the country. But this is an important one because, and I quote here: you 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 write, and this is a quote: "You cannot understand Korea's modern religious culture unless you take into account the impact of Christianity on how religion is defined today." And you also go beyond that and say Christianity has had a huge impact on the secular realm as well. This idea that it has not just come in, but it, but it has massively opened up and changed the religious landscape fundamentally. So let's go into that a little bit here. And you're right. One of the first reasons for this is uh, Christianity uh, has a lot of, of uh, stress on doctrine. And uh, so why is it so important that when Christianity came, this uh, fundamental focus on doctrine changed things? It really did change things. Right now, when the government of South Korea asks religious organizations to register with the government, they have to tell the government what their doctrines are. But even today, if I go visit a Buddhist temple, I've visited many Buddhist temples, nobody asks me what I believe. 
you know, Buddhist is all about practice. And shamans, I've been to many shaman rituals. They don't ask me if I believe in the gods they're interacting with. But you go to a Christian church, they're going to say, do you believe in Jesus? It's all about doctrine. And what this does, when doctrine becomes the core of religious community, it provides a boundary. Those who accept that doctrine are members of that community. Those who don't are not. So you have very clear boundaries. When you don't have that kind of doctrinal focus, then the boundaries between religious communities, Buddhist, Confucian, shaman, are blurred. And so this is new. It's Catholicism introduced the idea of doctrine, and Protestantism reinforced it. And more and more of the new non-Christian religions are also talking about their doctrines. But it really did change the way Koreans think of religion. I would argue that uh, many religions in Korea, Christianity not the only one, are, are what we call faith-based communities. It's defined by their creed. But traditional Korean religion, I would call ritual-based. In other words, people came together for rituals without thinking about what their doctrinal implications of the rituals were. And that's why I said earlier, you, a person could go to a shaman ritual, a Buddhist ritual, and a Confucian ritual in the same day and not find any problems with that, even though the, the doctrines of those three traditions are quite different. And so um, what we have here with, with doctrine is again, creating sharper lines, dividing one religious community from another, but also requiring a greater commitment on the person of believers. To become a Christian, you have to study Christianity. you got to study the doctrines. Buddhists are starting to do that now. They, what they're doing now in Korea are having Buddhists come in and study Buddhist teachings, and then they get a little certificate saying they've done that. That's new in Buddhism. They didn't used to do that in traditional times. Christians have done that kind of thing from the very beginning. And I have to assume that that is quite appealing to people. You mentioned earlier this idea of mod of modernity, and of course, Korean life is so focused around ideas of education. Perhaps there's some Confucian hangover from this idea. I have to assume that that simply that idea of of education and learning and achieving something must be quite attractive to the modern Korean mindset. I think it is. I think one of the reasons Catholicism has been doing so well in the last thirty. 30 years or so, is that to be a Catholic, you have to go through six months of instruction. <laughs> um, Protestant churches want to instruct you as well, but basically you become a Protestant Christian by just saying, hey, I believe, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. That's it, right? Um, and so yeah, that, that appealed to people. And that's why Buddhism, I think, has seen that and has started introducing these re religious classes for Buddhists and give, giving them, you got to give them the certificate of graduation. If you just teach them and don't give them something to prove they've been to those classes, it doesn't work, right? So they, yes. they give them those certificates saying, you are well-educated Buddhist now, and people like that. So we we, we did mention earlier um, some other ideas like of, of the, ex the exclusivity here and the idea of proselytizing. But what we didn't perhaps touch on as much as we should have is this idea of participation, this idea of it being a participatory uh, faith. So what? why was this so important and why did this change things? Yeah, I argue it's the Protestant missionaries and Protestants who entered this participatory religion in Korea. Traditional shamanism, if you've been to a shaman ritual, you watch the shaman. She may ask you questions occasionally, but basically you watch her perform. Traditional Buddhist rituals, the Buddhist monks are chanting, not even in Korean sometimes, they're, they're chanting, they're, they're reading Chinese language texts with strange Korean pronunciation, and you're watching. Um, and even the Catholic Church until the 1960s, the priests said mass in Latin, and the people watched. But Protestantism, when it arrived in the late 19th century, immediately introduced services in Korean to communal singing, people praying together and singing together, not just the pastor, but the congregation. And that became a whole new mode of, of re religiosity. So now you see the Catholic Church is now worldwide moved to having mass in the local language, and people participate more in the mass. The priest faces the congregation, whereas before they, the priest had his back to the congregation. You see uh, Buddhist temples now that have, have uh, uh, pianos in the Buddhist temple, so people can sing along to Buddhist hymns. <laughs> but that's all new. The whole idea of, of that the lay person participates in the ritual was really introduced by Protestants. And that was one of the reasons Protestantism was so successful. And other people have seen that in other religions. They said, we have to imitate that as well and create participatory religious services. And now I would say it, almost all religions in Korea are based on participatory religious rituals. So before we go a bit deeper into this idea and get towards important movements like democratization, the Guangzhou uprising and uh, civil rights, you, there is an important uh, factor here. And you, and you write that 
you bumped into a lot of people inside Korea, often respected scholars, who will say that monotheism uh, was been on the on the peninsula before Catholicism arrived. Uh, this is an, a quite interesting challenge. This idea of of one deity in the sky and one when one supreme being. And you write, this is a, a phenomenon that many people say existed, but there's not a lot of evidence for it. At least that's what I read from your research. You're right. Um, actually, I, I claim that it's James Gale, a Canadian who created the myth of indigenous Korean monotheism. I'm an historian primarily of the Chosun dynasty. I read a lot of Chosun dynasty texts. I don't see any references to one God in those texts. Um, and I'm, the current term that people prefer, the Protestants, in refer Hananim, never shows up in traditional text. Occasionally, you'll see a reference to Hanul Heaven, and some more liberal Protestants and Catholics use Hanul, Hanul Nim, uh, but what, we don't see that as a reference to one God. That was created by the Protestant missionaries who convinced Koreans, because the, the Protestant missionaries who arrived in Korea in the late 19th century believed that all humanity had been monotheistic at one point, and in some places, religiosity had deteriorated into polytheism. And so they were looking for, for monotheism, and they thought they found it. And of course, Koreans, early Christians, who wanted to believe that they weren't really rejecting their ancestors' traditions, um, came to believe by being a monotheist, we're really affirming our traditions of our ancient ancestors. And so it really took off. I've even seen one new religion that's not Christian at all, has been publishing pamphlets saying the Christians stole our hononym. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, but it's, it's a myth. I mean, I'm, again, I'm an historian. If somebody can show me a monotheistic document before the Catholics arrive in Korea in the late 18th century, then I'll change my line. But I, I've, I've been saying this for 20 years, and nobody's been able to show me any documents that show any indigenous monotheism in Korea. So on that same point, you do write here that that this is quite late when you think about it. You you you, you write the uh, the first time that 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 uh, the Chosen Dynasty seemed to have erected a uh, a shrine to heaven, and the king, and you're right, and the king felt bold enough to publicly worship there, was in 1897, and this was when it uh, no longer, it also announced it was no longer subservient to China. So this is incredibly late for an indigenous faith, an indigenous monotheism. That's right. Well, first of all, as long as China was the hegemon in East Asia, the Korean king could not call himself an emperor. He could only call himself a king. That obviously changed in 1896. So only the emperor could worship heaven. And so the king couldn't. Uh, there was a time in the Korea dynasty for a while when China was weak, when the ruler of Korea tried to worship heaven. But as soon as China was strong again, he had to stop. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically, when the, the king worshiping heaven, the, now the emperor of Korea, or worshiping heaven in the late 19th century, was not saying, I'm restoring an ancient Korean tradition. What he's saying is, I am no longer beholden to the emperor of China. So uh, this is this, now this this I found quite fascinating. You do write from there that it was the Catholic Church that first introduced monotheism to the to the peninsula. But you write, and this is quite fascinating when you, when you think about it. It was founded in the absence of missionaries. So how was this possible, and what did it it mean for the lay person on the ground who was building this church up from nothing? It is fascinating. That's why I chose that for my doctoral dissertation many years ago. Uh, how do these people become Catholics when there were no priests in Korea? And it was basically books written in China, in Chinese, by European missionaries, primarily Jesuits. And Koreans were you know, regularly going to China on tributary missions or for tribute to the Chinese emperor. And they would, they would go book shopping when they were there. And they would find these books um, in Beijing, and they would bring them back to Korea, and they would read them. And the Jesuit writings that they were reading in the 18th century were saying, uh, Confucianism is not bad. It's got the right ethics. But it misses one thing, belief in God. And so you can fulfill Confucianism by becoming a monotheist, a Catholic. And some, some, a few Koreans begin to believe that. And they begin, one of them went to Korea, went to China, was baptized by a priest in Beijing, came back and started preaching to his relatives and friends and baptizing them. And pretty soon you had a Catholic community in Korea without a priest. Now that lasted about 10 years. A Chinese priest was smuggled into Korea in 1794. Uh, he lasted uh, seven years before he was caught and executed because the government didn't like Catholics. <laughs> and uh, and then the Korea was out of priest again until the 1830s when some French priests were smuggled in. And so basically, and they were also caught by the government and killed. So the first hundred years of Catholicism in Korea, and the Catholic Church got to Korea a century before the Protestants did, 
the first hundred years of Catholicism was mostly spent without priests, which is really incredible. And so, uh, but, but they had these books and they were understanding Catholic doctrine from these books. And, and again, doctrine is very important to them. And they were frustrated because they knew, according to Catholic doctrine, you need a priest for certain rituals. <laughs> and yes. that's why they were so desperate to smuggle priests into Korea. Mm -hmm. So let's begin to step out this extraordinary impact of Christianity here. Now, one of the first things that I suppose as we build up to this rights movement and, uh, and modernity and democratization is, this, uh, is the role of women inside society. And you write that, uh, that uh, Christianity had a huge impact on this, uh, much more so than things like uh, Catholicism. But you're right, uh, a lot of people will have retroactively looked back and said that uh, Christianity granted women equal rights, which of course isn't true, but it did substantially increase the amount of rights that they would have ordinarily have had. That's right. Um, when people tell me that Christianity gave equality to women, I, I asked them how many women pastors are, there are in Korea. <laughs> <laughs> But it's true that what Christianity, what the Protestants, well, first of all, Catholics, during those periods of persecution, uh, they realized that the, when the priests came to Korea, they couldn't go into the women's quarter. So they would deputize certain women to go in and, and, and teach Catholic doctrines, which is, again, a new idea that women would be going around preaching, um, not to the men, but to other women. But when Protestants came in, s same thing. They realized they couldn't enter the women's quarter. The missionaries, foreign missionaries, realized they could not enter women's quarters. So they started training women. Uh, to go in and do two things, to preach Christian doctrines, but also to teach women how to read so they could read the Bible. The first formal education for women in Korea was with Protestant Christianity because they wanted them to be able to read the Bible. And um, that was a major transformation when, when women could you know, go, to, go to school to learn to read. And um, then, of course, we see when they started building their churches and churches were legal, they would name men elders, but also they would name a woman. They call it Kwanza. Uh, that's like a not not quite proselytizer, a woman equivalent of an elder, right? And so mm. they give women titles, which you never got in Confucianism. And Buddhist nuns were kind of marginalized even more than Buddhist monks were. So they didn't get any real titles. But Protestant Christianity gave women these titles and responsibilities, and that was new in Korea. So. Even though I don't say that Christianity gave women equality, it definitely enhanced the status of women and their the options they have in life for, for work outside the home. And uh, this begins a, a train and a movement towards a rights revolution of sorts. Now, you, now of course, you are, a, a, as you say, an historian of the Chosen Dynasty. And in some ways, we have this in interesting moment of these two Chosen scholars uh, challenging the Chosen Dynasty and saying there are, uh, there are moments and there are places that the Chosen government shouldn't step into, into their life and shouldn't interfere in their own religious practice. And this is back in 1791. And you're right, this is an important moment because it's not just a, it, it it is an explicit call for religious freedom but underneath it all is a statement about uh, the role of the state and how powerful it should be exactly now i mentioned earlier that buddhism was marginalized in the joseon dynasty but the buddhist monks never stood up and said you have no right to tell us how to practice our religious belief they just tried to kind of stay out of the government's uh, vision <laughs> kind of hide same thing with shamans shamans never stood up and said you can't tell us not to do this they would just try to avoid uh, the government seeing what they were doing. But in 1791, when two uh, young Confucian scholars had faced a dilemma, uh, the mother of one of them had passed away, and they had to have a memorial service for her, a funeral for her, but they had heard from the bishop in Beijing that Catholics couldn't erect what we call a spirit tablet, a little tablet you put on a little altar that has the name of the deceased, and they couldn't erect that tablet and bow before it, which is an essential part of the Confucian morning ritual. They refused to erect that tablet, and they were arrested and, and beheaded. Uh, but before they were beheaded, we read their interrogation, and they're saying, look, I'm a good, I'm a good subject of the king. The only thing is I have this one sphere of my life where I have to follow God's laws, they were saying, not the Pope's laws, God's laws. And the government has no right to interfere in what God wants me to do and not do. And that was, again, new. And I argue that even though they weren't calling for democracy, they weren't calling for broad religious freedom, that was the first time any group had specifically said, this is one area of society where the government cannot interfere. Theoretically, the Chosun government could interfere wherever it wanted. It didn't have te technological capabilities doing that, but theoretically it could. 
But the Catholics were saying, no, you can't. And there are some areas that are off limits to the government. That's our practice of, of our religion. And that slowly expanded over the centuries until in the 20th century, you had um, in the 70s and 80s, when Christians were fighting for democracy, uh, they were saying the fight for democracy is God's law. <laughs> and so the government can't interfere with our fight to make Korea a democratic country. And uh, as, as, as we build up there, one of the important things here, you're right, is because you had, there was Christianity and Catholicism on the ground inside South Korea, uh, when Korea was forced to sign treaties with Western powers, so this is almost gunboat diplomacy, but in some ways this opened up the, the religious space, but suddenly Korea were fully aware that uh, these, these are the religions of the West who they are signing these, uh, these treaties with, and now a lot more circumspect about the persecution of Catholics and Christians. And you write also that uh, one of the huge, uh, as I indicated there, one of the huge important factors here for this Catholic rights movement and this freedom of, of of religion was it's being joined by Protestantism. That's right. That's right. It was actually, when the when the Protestants arrived in 1884, uh, Western missionaries, uh, they were not legally allowed to be missionaries. But at, already at that point, the Korean government knew it couldn't kill Westerners, but it didn't want to legalize Christianity, so it allowed them to come in as educators and physicians. <laughs> um, but I mean, obviously, they they began building churches and began converting people. Um, and and so it was building churches in Seoul at a time when Buddhists were not allowed to build temples in Seoul. Think about that. Buddhists were barred from Seoul for most of the Joseon dynasty. And yet Christians began to build churches. The Myeongdong Cathedral, they began building that in the 1880s. Okay? Um, and even at that time, the, the, the oldest Korean indigenous religion called Chendokyo now um, was still outlawed. And yet Christians both Catholics and Protestants by this point, the government turning a blind eye to their activities, were allowed to proselytize openly in Seoul. And so this really opened things up because the Buddhists said, we got to get in the Seoul. Chando Kyo said, this isn't fair. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> um, and it really changed uh, the, the whole notion because the Christians were backed by foreign powers. The French insisted when they signed a, forced Korea to sign, sign a treaty with them, they, they forced Korea to agree to a clause what it said was, Westerners have a right to teach, which, of course, the French interpreted as proselytizing. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, and, and then, of course, the Protestants demanded the same thing. And so that finally the government was forced to legally open up space for religious competition in the country, which then Buddhists and Tandokyo began saying, hey, what about us? <laughs> you know, So it, it created a religious market. What's interesting during the colonial period, by the way, the Japanese, not wanting to anger the West, as before the 19, late 1930s, uh, didn't want to anger the West. They were forced to tolerate um, Catholic and Protestant religious activity. They encouraged Buddhism because the Japanese were Buddhist. And what's interesting, they allowed new religions from Japan to operate openly in Korea, but new Korean religions were called pseudo-religions. They were illegal. <laughs> so, um, yes. And then Shinto, state Shinto, which first Shinto shrine wasn't open in Seoul until 1925, was called not a religion because they wanted all Koreans to go to those shrines. And they knew that some Koreans would say, that's not our religion. They said, no, state Shinto is not a religion. You're paying respects to the emperor of Japan through ritual, but it's not religious ritual. So you have to do that. And But other religions, only Protestantism, Catholicism and Buddhism and some Japanese new religions are legitimate. Yes. Uh, so I'm glad you brought in the uh, colonial period there because we're going to step this forward just beyond that. And you're right. This is this for many people would be the breakout movement and it's uh, for for uh, Christianity and Cath and Catholicism on the peninsula. But it doesn't tend to be. And this is the uh, the end of the colonial period. And you're right. Despite this period ending and despite Sungman Rhee coming to power, who was a Methodist who was educated in America and spent many years there, uh, it doesn't take off. And in some ways, this is the communist threat from North Korea that many people see. So they're kind of occupied by this fear. And it does. It takes until uh, Park Park Jung Hee comes to power, and uh, his his uh, Yushin dec his Yushin Constitution, his Declaration of One Man Rule, that uh, Christians really find their voice out there and have, and this call for democracy begins to uh, sound out. Yeah, I think that's right. I think 
uh, Protestants weren't interested in, in arguing against Sigmund Rhee. Well, some were, but most were not because he was he was also Protestant, right? <laughs> but mm. Proctor he was not. Uh, but also, again, what you have under Proctor and he had the beginning of Korea's modern economic development, and along with that goes urbanization. And so you had these um, the Koreans moving from the villages to Seoul, moving to Pusan, also mainly Seoul, and deciding, you know, they, they don't know what they're doing there. And then Christians come to them and say, here, we have an instant community for you, our church. And some of these people are quite poor. And they're meeting these pastors who are saying, you're poor, not because of any problem of your own, but it's the way the government is favoring the already wealthy. And then, of course, you have industrialization brings factory workers. And there was something called the Urban Industrial Mission run by Protestant missionaries and, and Korean pastors that was going into the factories and telling the workers, God wants you to be respected as human beings. That means you should have a living wage. Okay. And so uh, it was basically the industrialization of Korea under Park Chung-hee and the urbanization that went along with that that created space for Christians, proselytizers, to convince many Koreans that Christianity gives you a, a language for critiquing the way your government is treating you. And, um, and also one more thing, um, Buddhists were not really involved in the p- political protests until the late uh, 1980s. And the reason is every time the uh, Park government arrested prominent Korean pastors, Christians in the United States would complain to the U.S. Congress and State Department and Korea would hear about it. They could arrest a Buddhist monk. Nobody worried in America, right? Mm. It was yes. the contacts that the Korean Christians had, both Catholic and Protestant, but in the 70s, mostly Protestants. They gave them some protection. I mean, Protestant pastors still went to jail. Um, uh, uh, missionaries would be expelled, but uh, Protestant pastors went to jail. But they wouldn't stay in jail that long because of all the protests that were coming from the United States. So let's step into 1980, into the Gwangju Massacre. Uh, yeah. Before we get into the details of the questions here, a, a lot of my listeners will be quite aware of what uh, the Gwangju Massacre was. But uh, importantly, before we step into it, uh, you were there. You were a witness in some ways on the ground itself. So uh, before we get into uh, all the fundamentals here, uh, tell me about your personal story with Gwangju. That's where I first lived when I went to Korea. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Gwangju from 1971 to 1974. I lived with a Korean family there. We came very close to them. I'm still uh, very close with uh, the nephew of my landlady. I was back in Korea in 1979, 1980 uh, in Seoul, working on my doctoral dissertation. But then I heard on a shortwave radio, I had to rely on that. There was no, of course, no um, internet then, but also the censorship of the local Korean press. But a shortwave radio told me what was happening in Gwangju that the South Korean military, as part of their coup d'etat, had attacked the unarmed citizens of Gwangju because they were demonstrating for democracy and it started killing them with bayonets um, and um, beating some to death and later started shooting them, even from helicopters. We now have that confirmed. And so I was determined to get down there from Seoul to find out what was happening. I wanted to make sure my Korean family, I call them, were alive, first of all. To get into the city, the city was surrounded by the military, but they only blocked the major roads. And so I managed to get close to Kwangju, and then I found a bunch of grandmother types uh, carrying bags of rice on a mountain trail into the city because people were in Kwangju had been cut off for a while, didn't have much food. I followed them into the city, and what I saw haunts me today. I mean, I, I, um, I'd never seen people kill before or since in my life. And the, the carnage was everywhere. And it's the look on in the eyes of the people there. You can see they're all in a state of shock. Um, and so I, I got out of there and had to get through army lines to get out of Gwangju. I went to Seoul and prepared to leave Korea uh, to move to Japan to complete my research because I was so upset. I could no longer work in Korea. I didn't go back to Korea for seven years, basically, because of what I'd seen there. Um, People in Gwangju suffered more than any people deserve to suffer. Uh, they, uh, the, the official total of 287 or so dead, uh, uh, that doesn't count 800 or so missing. And so the official total is probably 900 to 1,000 dead. And the dead ranged in age from 2 to 80. A lot of people who were killed were not demonstrators. They were uh, simply people who got caught up in the demonstrations. For example, I talked to one housewife. And she lived in a second floor apartment in the main street in downtown Gwangju. And she told me that her husband had heard noise on the street below, not knowing it was a demonstration, had opened his window to look out 
and a soldier saw him and thought he might be a threat and blew his brains out with his rifle. Uh, those are the kind of people who were killed in Guangzhou. So um, it was the most important, most tragic event, most important event in South Korean history since the Korean War. It's still quite controversial. Some people don't want to admit what happened there. It um, it definitely changed my life. I'm still haunted by the memories of what I saw in Guangzhou in 1980. So that's an extraordinary personal story. There, that's uh, I have I've heard a lot about the Guangzhou massacre over the years, but I never quite heard it in those details. It's quite extraordinary to hear it like that. Um, so uh, from that uh, ho- that horrific violence there, there's a place on the ground, and, and you right before that you 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 said. Uh, a lot of the uh, the Protestants and the Catholics had a certain degree of immunity in this in this uh, democracy movement in a sense that uh, the West uh, had had would protest if they were arrested and they had a, a degree of immunity that the Buddhists wouldn't have. But in this one, you write that in some ways the Catholics became to bear came to bear the brunt of the government uh, uh, crackdown in this. And you say that at least some of this had to do with the fact that um, you write. Uh, Protestant pastors, sorry, um, uh, Catholic priests, unlike Protestant pastors, because they didn't have families, the government felt more uh, comfortable locking them up in prison because they didn't have a family to look after. Yeah, I think that's the case. Well, we, uh, starting about May 22nd, the Kwangju episode is from May 18th to May 27th. But May 22nd, when the army had been chased out of the city for a few days, the citizens of the Kwangju formed what they called a settlement committee to try to negotiate between the city of Kwangju and the military. And they asked certain leading citizens to serve on that settlement committee. Protestant pastors were asked, they refused, that probably they didn't want a very visible presence. Um, the army would notice them and they'd come up to them and their family. But two Catholic priests did agree to serve on that committee. There were, there were prominent Protestant uh, lay people, but no pastors on that committee. So when the government did recover the city um, in, um, on May 27th, uh, they arrested most of the members of the settlement committee. So Catholic priests were the only clerics in Kwangju uh, that were arrested. And two of them, actually eight out of, there were only 10 Catholic priests in Kwangju in 1980. Eight, eight of them uh, were released after interrogation, but two of them spent over a year in jail. Um, I do need to point out that Protestants were doing a lot behind the scenes. For example, there was an American Protestant missionary at the Christian hospital in Kwangju who gave me some x-rays from his hospital that he said showed that the Korean military were using soft shell bullets. These are the bullets that shatter on impact with the human body. So it's hard for a surgeon to take out all the pieces. They're illegal in war. He had x-rays proving that he collected them at much personal risk, gave them to me uh, to smuggle to the army line to Seoul. Uh, He also sheltered about 20 or so of young people in his home in the basement of his home when the army was trying to round up all young men. Again, anybody who was a young man in Kwangju was probably a rebel. And there were other uh, Christian Protestants who did that as well. But the only ones who were arrested uh, in the immediate aftermath in Kwangju were Catholic priests. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out um, more about that. I've got, um, and the Buddhists weren't involved because Buddhist temples, even back then, still tended to be in the countryside, not in the city. So they would not, they would have been on the other side of the army lines. <laughs> mm. um, but um, the, the May 18th Memorial Foundation, which is dedicated to digging over information about what happened in those terrible days, 1980, has got separate volumes of oral histories of Catholics, Protestants, and Buddhists. Uh, and I've been trying to work my way through those accounts, but it's very painful to read it because it brings back painful memories. Um, mm. But it's very clear, all three religious communities believed that their religious beliefs told them they had to speak out and try to save the people in Kwangju. But it was the Catholic priests who were the most visible in the city itself, and they were the ones who were arrested. Now, the rest of the country, a lot of Protestant pastors were also arrested later. But in the city of Kwangju itself, it was the Catholic priest. And uh, I'm going to touch on just one other part of your personal story that you that you put in your writings here. I think it's quite important to give a picture of just how uh, the scene was at this time, this broad, because it wasn't just in Guangzhou, it was across the whole of Korea. And you write... This is a quote. I still remember seeing posters on the wall in Guangzhou in 1974, asking people asking people to report to the to the police sightings of leaders of university student Christian groups, which had planned nonviolent nationwide demonstrations against Park's dictatorship. Uh, 
You then say, of course, as you mentioned there, I didn't see any such wanted posters for Buddhist groups. But that gives a feel of the kind of the uh, what I, I have to assume was what the feeling was on the ground at the time, a certain uh, internal hunting of sorts of these of these uh, of these uh, Christian leaders and these Christian groups. And of course, you're right. People like Kim Tae Young, of course, they were Protestants. Look, um, what happened in 1974 it was a group of Protestants, uh, students, university students who believed in both Christianity and democracy had been meeting under the cover of Bible study groups, planning simultaneously nationwide nonviolent uprising against Park Chung-hee's Yushin dictatorial regime. The government found out two days before those uprisings, demonstrations were going to take place. And so they went out and tried to arrest the leaders. Most of them went underground, but they were caught later. And they did put up these posters, and these were mostly Protestants at the time, and it was the University Christian Student Federation. Uh, When they were arrested, it was quite interesting. Some of them were condemned to death later. They weren't executed eventually, but they were condemned to death. When one of them uh, was condemned to death, he bowed to his judges and said, I'm honored to be condemned to death by a court such as this. They were very brave. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was each other later become a member of Kim Dae-jung's party in the parliament. Um, And so... Uh, that's when the government began to see that uh, Christianity was a threat because Christians tended to believe that they should respect their government, but if God told them to act otherwise, they had to act contrary to the government's decrees. If God said respect human beings um, as all deserving respect um, and your government says don't, uh, you follow God's rules. And that's what these people were doing. Again, it was mostly Protestants in the 1970s, in the 80s, the Catholic Church uh, moved to the forefront of the struggle for democracy. Um, again, because the Catholic priests don't have to worry about their how they're going to feed their wife and kid if they go to jail, right? <laughs> mm. uh, so uh, from that, let's, let's, let's take another step forward, and I think this will help explain some of those questions we may not have touched on enough, like uh, the why Christianity has been so successful inside South Korea. And uh, this is, goes back to our religious marketplace a little bit here. So uh, in that in that religious marketplace, this is one of those scenes that you set across uh, South Korea. You talk about these three large uh, um, re- re- religions, so Christianity, uh, uh, Protestantism, uh, Catholicism, and Buddhism, but you write that that leaves half the country non-religious. Now, this is an odd phenomenon for many people. They think if there's a if there's a religious marketplace and such competition, why are they failing to tie in that uh, that fifty percent of the country that self-identify as non-religion? Um, they they are traditional. They don't see the need for a specific religious affiliation. If when Gallup asks Koreans, "Do you believe in God?" It, they over well, well, it could be a plural, God or God. Well, over half the population says yes. And then Gallup says, Are you a member of a religious community? And they say, No. <laughs> <laughs> I have to Buddhist temples in Korea, one of a mountain trail to the top of a mountain to a temple. And I'll ask people hiking with me, Koreans, uh, Why are you going up this trail? Oh, we're going to pray at the temple. Are you Buddhist? No, why do you ask? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so basically, even though Christianity introduced the notion that if you go to a temple, you, go, you engage in a ritual, that you are a member of that religious community, only about half the Korean people have bought into that. Another half don't. But they do go to temples. They do go to shamans. Um, it's just that they don't call themselves a member of that religious community. So let's talk about, as you put here, some of the losers in this in this religious marketplace. So we talk about the three big six, uh, success stories, and we can touch on Buddhism a bit more, I suppose. But uh, let's talk about the losers. Now, you mentioned shamanism there, but let's go to the other one here. And this is really interesting because uh, you write in the start of an article here, you write, South Koreans like to brag about their country being the most, the most Confucian on earth. Now, this is challenging, of course, but... Uh, this is one of those uh, hangovers that people say we are Confucian and you put in some interesting detail here about how it it is and it isn't. So first of all, just as a brief overview, what exactly is Confucianism inside South Korea? <laughs> well, well, right now it's mostly ethical rhetoric and ancestor respect for ancestors shown through ritual. Uh, by ethical rhetoric, I mean they teach ethics classes in their high schools in Korea. And what are the ethics they teach? Loyalty filial piety, trustworthiness. These are all traditional Confucian virtues. And they don't teach them as Confucian, but they are traditional Confucian virtues. Uh, What I find most Confucian about Korea, even Korean Christians who are told you can't have a traditional Confucian memorial ritual. In traditional ritual, you have this this spirit tablet, 
with the name of your deceased parent or grandparent on a little altar and you bow before it. They can't do that, but they still have a ritual without the tablet on the anniversary of a parent or grandparent's death. I live in North America. My parents have passed away. I'm an old man. I don't have a ritual on the anniversary of their death. I remember them on the anniversary of their death, but not with the ritual. But Koreans still have to have that ritual. And another way that we see the Confucian influence is think about the pervasiveness of the word udi in Korean, which means we or our. In the West, we say my. I mean, Koreans <laughs> even call their wife my house person. <laughs> I mean, and, uh, and they in quite uh, tr trickily, when you, when, when you listen to them speaking, they will say our mother or our brother. Right, right, as right. In you, you're kind of confused of whose brother they're talking about, yours or the her or theirs. It's, it's quite, yeah. Well, when I refer, you know, Koreans always call it Korea, our country. If I say our Canada, they go, what? Yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so it said in Confucianism, you're not an individual. You are part of a community. You're defined by your various roles in society as a child, as a parent, as a student, as a teacher, whatever, as, uh, as a mother or father. And I say that that still holds some extent in Korea, although it's changing, especially with the younger generation. They still define themselves by their family. Uh, by their classmate, what school they went to. Uh, and so it, you, it, this community consciousness, this use of our all the time, it shows like Confucianism is still there in the, in, the in the group orientation, in the ethical vocabulary, using words like sincerity and, and loyalty and filial piety. I never talk about filial piety in Canada. Um, and, and also the way they feel the need for some kind of a ritual to honor their parent, deceased parents and grandparents on the anniversary of their death. All of that shows that Confucianism is still there in the background in Korean culture. Now, there are many non-Confucian elements in Korean culture. The respect for businessmen. Confucians were against business. <laughs> so, uh, But the respect for education, that is so Confucian. In Joseon Dynasty, you got ahead, a man got ahead by getting a good Confucian education. And what do Koreans all want? To, Korea has the highest rate in the world of attendance at post-secondary institutions. Where did that come from? I think from Confucianism. So let's, let's take one more step into Confucianism before we leave it behind here. This is interesting, as you mentioned a lot there, just how much Koreans still see this as something in their lives. But you write, and this is really interesting, you write, and this is a quote again, I know of no respectable philosophers in Korea today who are trying to keep Li and Ki, I'm probably pronouncing them wrong, uh, metaphysics, me metaphysics alive as a viable philosophy. You're right. This is a historical teaching, but many people still attach themselves to it. And you put this interesting analysis through as uh, you talk about um, uh, you run through things like, as you mentioned, the loyalty, filial piety, and you think, well, these things may be Confucian in value, but they're also this, this, the kind of things that will turn up in a lot of different cultures all around the world as well. So what still makes this country Kore uh, Confucian? It's increasingly hard to to put your foot on it in, in, in some ways. It's quite a slippery concept. And you talk about um, that, this idea of, of, of a male hierarchy. Well, that's certainly slipping away inside South Korea today. Um, as well as this sort of deference to the state as the absolute rule. There is no king, of course, but uh, as, uh, as, of course, uh, you mentioned Park Gune, she's a, a previous, she's a, they've had a pre, uh, female president in this country now. So I might yet a touch on just how much uh, Confucianism may at least be slipping away in the realities of people's lives, even if they personally like to think of themselves as still Confucian. It was definitely slipping away. When I first went to Korea, it was very difficult for a young person to choose solely by themselves who they're going to marry. They had to get their parents' permission. And often, in many cases, they had to wait for their parents to introduce them to somebody. That's because marriage and Confucianism is a family matter. It's not an individual matter. But now I see Koreans saying, hey, mom and dad, I met the person I'm going to marry. Bye. <laughs> you know? mm. uh, that's quite different. Um, and again, the respect for, for business. Again, back in the 1970s, when I first went to Korea, Koreans went to graduate school in North America. They studied political science because Confucians wanted to work in the government. Now what do Koreans study when they go to graduate school in North America? Business or engineering, right? <laughs> uh, it's all the things that Confucians didn't respect. And so we do see Korea has this mixture of Confucianism and non-Confucianism. You mentioned Park Geun-hye earlier. When I was in Korea in the 70s, she was tasked by her father, Park chung hee with promoting what they call the New Mind Movement which is supposed to restore traditional Korean values in Korea. What were those traditional Korean values? Loyalty, filial piety, and etiquette. 
which is all Confucian values. That was Park Gunei. <laughs> mm. And and again, those are still what is taught in the in the textbooks, the ethics textbooks in the schools. And so you do get this mixture. Um, you still get the respect, the Confucian respect um, for people older than you. Um, my Canadian students will occasionally call me by my first name. Never in Korea would that happen. I'm always professor, right? Mm. <laughs> uh, and again, the respect for education, but but also you had the respect for business people. Uh, you know, so uh, that's that's not Confucian. Respect for the military was not Confucian. You see that in modern Korea. And so it really is a mixture. Uh, basically, what modern Koreans have done, including the government, but also the people, they've taken from Confucianism what they feel is useful in the modern world, like respect for education and group orientation, and got rid of things that don't feel that useful, like the ancient metaphysics, what we call Neo-Confucianism, E.G. metaphysics. Uh, they feel that's not useful, so they just got rid of that. So uh, they Koreans have chosen what they like in Confucianism and just ignored the rest. And uh, I should point out, by the way, in Taiwan and Hong Kong, you still have philosophy departments philosophizing about Confucianism trying to create a modern Confucianism. I don't see that in Korea. So let's step into Buddhism, and this is really fascinating. So this is the the third of the three big religions inside the country. And, of course, it had to make, as you mentioned there, had to make a rapid uh, return to the central sphere of Korean life because under the Chosen Dynasty and uh, Neo-Confucian rule, it was pushed away into the mountains and they weren't allowed to practice it. So when the country reopens, it, it has a battle on its, uh, in, in its, on its hands to get back inside the country. But... I and many people listening might be slightly shocked why it hasn't been so successful in returning uh, to the country, why it's just one of three large faiths instead of the dominant faith. Because for a country turning towards religion and a, and a, and a competitive marketplace, there must have been an impulse to look towards their own history and their, a long history of Buddhism in, in, inside the country rather than these imported faiths. And there's already temples around in the mountains. There's a history inside your family. So uh, let's go to those origins of Buddhism and uh, its attempt to return and uh, why it perhaps has, hasn't been so successful in uh, in capturing a much larger percentage of the marketplace. Buddhism had an image problem, two ways. One, the Japanese, when they got colonized Korea, promoted Buddhism. So Buddhism came to be seen as pro-Japanese, whereas Christians, because they, they refused to show ritual respect for the emperor, calling out idolatry, were seen as nationalist. So Buddhism was compromised, especially because during the colonial period, the vast majority of Korean Buddhist monks followed the Japanese example and got married. <laughs> mm. uh, also, the Buddhism didn't have the tradition of proselytizing on city streets, which Christianity had. But probably more important, when the first Protestant missionaries arrived in Korea, again, they had to come in not as missionaries, but as educators and physicians. So what do they do? They opened up modern schools and modern hospitals. So Christianity was immediately identified with modernity, particularly Protestant Christianity, whereas Buddhism came to be identified with village life, particularly with uneducated village women. Until about 20 or 30 years ago, that was the image of Buddhism in Korea, a religion for uneducated village women. That's only begun to change in the last 20 or 30 years. And so the identification of Christianity with modernity and the the, the difficulty Buddhists had in transitioning to a more competitive environment in which they were supposed to go out and attract new converts, uh, that gave them, had them fall behind the Christians in the race to claim a greater share of the South Korean population. But, of course, as you mentioned earlier, they this sounds like quite a transformation because when you first, uh, when I first started reading through your research and I started reading about these faiths, I thought to myself, well, of course Buddhism is going to suffer a little bit here because it's it's more of a um, introspective faith in the sense that um, you go to temple, you pray by yourself, and you're not necessarily getting guidance here or there, and it's more of a internal meditation. It's, at least in some people's minds, it can be these kinds of things. But you mentioned here how. It, in some ways, it very quickly began to mirror Christianity and and uh, copy the best aspects of it. So you talk about uh, things like there being uh, Sunday services, but there's also now Buddhist hymns, and it's much more particip uh, participatory as well. And these Buddhist uh, ceremonies are now mirror, in some ways, the the uh, Christian ceremonies. That's right. I actually have in my library what I call a Buddhist Bible. You, you'll see in Korea, Korean Christians often sit on this 
on the subway reading their Bible, right? So Buddhists wanted to have something similar. So the main order, Jogay order, put out a one-volume collection of Buddhist teachings, including, by the way, instructions for how to behave in a Buddhist temple, <laughs> but also has hymns in the back. So now there's this Buddhist Bible. Okay, But then they also have, you know, they've learned to modify the way they reach out to the public. There's a very famous book, a monk in Korea called Pumyun Sunim. Uh, I call him the Dear Abbey of Buddhism. What he does, he's quite amazing. I've seen him in operation. He gives a little lecture and then asks people to ask him questions about their problems they're having in their daily life. It can be a problem well, arguing with their spouse. Maybe their children aren't listening to them. They're having trouble in their business. He gives them practical suggestions for how to work through that problem based on the sutras. So he's, he's trying to make Buddhism as relevant to everyday life as Christianity has said it is. And he's quite amazing, by the way. I, I, it's all extemporaneous. I, I watched him in operation, and it, it's uh, he's very, very popular. Videotapes of his advising, se counseling sessions are available and Korean communities around the around the world watch them when they can't go to Korea and hear them in person. And so they learned to do that. And you already mentioned the hymns. And then more and more temples have these uh, social welfare operations. Um, and also Buddhism in the last 20 years in Korea has begun to identify with the environment. The Buddhists uh, were in the forefront of opposing Im Myung Bok's plan to um, – to build the, for the Four Great Rivers project, it would have torn up a lot of Buddhist temple land. <laughs> um, mm. But they, they, didn't, they didn't say we're losing our land. What they said was we're protecting the environment. Of course, that's very cool now, the environment. And, and so they're slow. They, they've become definitely respectable in Seoul now. Although still, what's interesting, in Seoul, there are still three times as many Christians as Buddhists. Where in Pusan, it's the opposite. There's three times as many Buddhists as there are Christians in Pusan. And I'm still trying to figure out what the difference is. <laughs> I was just going to ask what you thought the difference was. Yes. Um, uh, let's touch on uh, some of the what you put down here, the sideline groups, one of the some of the smaller sects as we begin to bring this to an end. And uh, one Buddhism. So what is one Buddhism and uh, uh, why does it remain so small? This is a, a very small sect in, in, inside the country. You're right. The 2005 census only said 130,000 one Buddhists uh, existed inside, at least identified themselves inside South Korea. Yeah, it is a small group, although I think there's more than that. I think a lot of the people just told the census they're Buddhist. They didn't distinguish themselves as one uh -huh. Buddhism. But one Buddhism is a unique Korean form of Buddhism. Uh, they have their own scriptures. They were founded in um, in 1916, so they're pretty new. Um, they have their own. They don't wear the traditional Buddhist garb. Most of their clerics are women, not men, although they have uh, male clerics. Uh, they used to call the, uh, they didn't call their temples temples. Now they do in English. It's called churches. You walk into a one Buddhist temple and it looks like a church. You've got pews, you've got an organ, they sing hymns. And for a while, they were the modern form of Buddhism. They were attracting a lot of middle class people who didn't want to be Christians. But modern Buddhism seemed to be be a way for them to be traditional Buddhist, but still be modern. But as mainstream Buddhism has modernized by introducing hymns and Sunday services and so on, one Buddhism has lost that special appeal it had for people who wanted to be modern and Buddhist. Um, it's still, they have, they have a university of their own. Um, they're, they're, they're a missionary religion. There's a modern Buddhist community here in Vancouver. Uh, they're, they're around the world. Uh, but yeah, they've, they've lost out because while they were able to market themselves as the modern version of Buddhism, they were doing fine. But now most one Buddhists are from one Buddhist families. The one Buddhist should, they don't really use their, uh, they don't really know how to um, sell themselves. They're not telling people that one Buddhist uh, temples, worship halls throughout Korea, over 500 of them, are slowly transitioning to solar power. I, I mm. noticed on their temples and i asked them oh yeah we're doing that why don't they talk about that <laughs> you know <laughs> it shows they're environmentally sensitive they don't talk about it but um and so and but they're also they're not real proselytizers one buddhism believes in preaching by example not by preaching verbally they want you to see what they do and be impressed by what they do and then if you get interested they'll tell you about their teachings so they're so not in, corners. in some ways it sounds like they might be Despite how all those, how promising all those things and upright and outstanding those things can be, I mean, it sounds very humble not to brag about your environmentalism, or it sounds very uh, quite, uh, um, I suppose, enlightening just to have people follow your example rather than telling them what to do. But 
it can't i'm assuming this is must be some of the reasons that they are such a small struggling sect inside south korea that they're not playing the capitalist game in this sense they're not fighting the market the best way they possibly can exactly exactly and you know in korea it's very important to have a good university yonsei university really helped the image of protestant uh, christianity Sogong helped the image of catholics wangong university is down there in the countryside first of all in chunju and not considered a, one of the best universities in Korea. And and again, that, that hurts their prestige, their image. Uh, even Dongguk universities in Seoul, that's one of the mainstream uh, Buddhist order. So they haven't been able to open up a major hospital in Seoul. They have one in the countryside. They haven't opened up a major ho- university in Seoul, their university in the countryside. So they have missed out on all the things you need to do to be more visible in Korea's religious marketplace. So as the last religion we're going to bring in here, um, Anglicanism, Anglicanism, and yes. uh, this, again, is struggling to carve out a niche for itself. So uh, what, uh, why, why is this uh, struggling to find space inside the market? Is it just failing to compete in the same way, or is it uh, being uh, swallowed up by people failing to distinguish it from other uh, faiths like uh, Catholicism, for example? I think it's both. I mean, first of all, I think Anglicans are not, uh, they're not hellfire and brimstone Christians. <laughs> they're not out there preaching on street corners. But also, Koreans have trouble figuring out what they are. They're not Catholic, but they use the Catholic word for God, the Lord of Heaven. They call their religious services mass, and it looks like a Catholic mass in many ways. Um, and but uh, and so they're, they're not Protestant in the way that Koreans think of Protestants. And so the Koreans can't figure them out. A lot of Koreans don't even know they're Anglicans in Korea. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Yeah. And maybe they're seen as too British because their their cathedral is next to the British Embassy in downtown Seoul, right? So, um, and they they call their pastors priests, right? Just like Catholics do. So, um, yeah, they haven't been able to carve out a distinctive image. That's what's hurt them. It's all about marketing. They haven't done a good marketing job. So as our last couple of questions here, we've talked about the transformation, this dramatic transformation inside South Korea and its whole religious landscape. Um, I wonder how you see it today, because you put through your writings here that there has been a slowdown of sorts. So despite the the massive uptick and uptake in people self-identifying as certain faiths over, over, over the years, you write that the market itself might become might be uh, to a degree saturated. That is, in it seems to be hold and steady. There's not a dramatic growth in any particular faith inside the country. So, what does the current Korean landscape looks uh, the Korean religious landscape look like? Very interesting. There was a 2015 census, which said actually the number of people who say they don't have a religion grew. It's now 56 percent of the population according to the government census. Uh, but also said the number of Buddhists dropped dramatically. I think that's the way they took the census. They took the census by computer before it had been door to door. And I think they go by household. I think in the household, the husband took charge of answering the census questions. And women tend to be more Buddhist than men. <laughs> so I think it skewed the figures. Um, but what we do see, um, even Gallup, which goes door to door, finds that younger people are less interested in becoming part of a formal religious organization. Religion tends, religious affiliation tends to appeal to the older people. And, but I think the main reason what's going on here is as Korea was rapidly urbanizing, you see the rapid growth in religious affiliation. As people moved to cities like Seoul and Busan, they needed a community. They didn't know anybody. And religious communities provide that community, right? Um, now, you, you can't urbanize anymore. Korea is about as urban as you can get. Right? And so people are don't feel that you don't have these influx of people looking for a new community. And also, I think what's happened with Protestant Christianity in Korea, it, to be a Protestant Christian in Korea can be exhausting, right, in two ways. Um, you're not expected to go to church only on Sunday. If you're a good Christian, you go to church every day. I have a brother-in-law who gets up every morning so and go to church at six o'clock before he goes to work. Um, and you're spe- expected to give 10% of your income to the church. The Protestant community in Korea has a very high high dropout rate. People get exhausted from it. Financially, that 10% demand, and also for the, if you want to be considered a serious member of your congregation, you're going to be going in six, seven days a week. Uh, and people are very busy in Korea anyway, and that adds to it. And it's exhausting. The Catholic Church and the Buddhist churches don't have some kind of heavy demands. The Catholic Church says, come to church once a week, that's fine. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So it's caused the Protestant church. Also, people have been turned off by the competition among the mega churches. 
and also the corruption among some of the mega churches. Um, and there have also been some scandals in the Buddhist community uh, as well. Uh, some Buddhist monks were caught gambling. So it turned out some Buddhists who were supposed to be celibate in the main order had had concubines, should we say, <laughs> like, <laughs> like um, that has turned people off. So I think right now the Koreans, have, they have found other ways to establish communities and urban environments. Um, they don't need religion so much for that anymore. But I don't think the religious community is going to shrink, but I don't see it growing as rapidly as it did for the four decades after uh, the Korean War. So as a, fin- as a final question on that, do you see – uh, there be in a space anywhere for any new should should we expect any dramatic changes in this landscape? I mean, it, you, there's uh, we haven't mentioned Tong Hak at all, but do you see this coming back? Do you see this growing? Do you see the reemergence of a new religion or a new uh, strong religion such as Islam, Hinduism, Mormonism, for example? There are so many pot- the pot- potentials out there. Do you see uh, the do you see the opportunity or the possibility for there to be a rapid change and a rapid growth inside this market? Or do you think this is this is what it is and it's fairly stable now? I think it's fairly stable, but I should point out there are a lot of new religions in Korea that are not Christian or Buddhist uh, that have emerged in the last century. And you mentioned Tongok, which is now Chundokyo. Uh, Chundokyo is a lot of Koreans don't even South Koreans don't even realize it exists anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And but there's a religion called Taesun Jiliwei, which has two universities and two major hospitals. Um, they're relatively new, only a few decades old. Um, they claim to have six million followers, but the government only finds six, 60 or 70,000. That's because Koreans don't like to be told they're a member of a cult. And if you go to a Taesun Jiliwei meeting hall and become a follower of that religion, your neighbors will say, oh, you're following that cult. They'll criticize you very strongly. And so people either hide the fact they're a member or they they don't join in the first place. And so there's that, Korea is very much into conforming, right? It's respectable now to be a Buddhist, respectable to be a Catholic, respectable to be a Protestant. It's still not respectable, by the way, to be a Mormon. If you're a Mormon, your Christian friends will say you're a heretic. Um, And if you don't taste in Chile, people say you're following a cult. And so the new religions have that barrier have to overcome that Koreans want to be part of a respectable community and new religions. One Buddhism has gained respectability. When Kim Dae Jung died, there were four different religions represented at his funeral, state funeral: Catholic, Protestant, mainstream Buddhist, and one Buddhist. But uh, none of the other religious communities were there. Mormons weren't there. Taesun Chiliwe wasn't there. Chandogyo wasn't there. And so it's that. Wanting to go along, uh, you don't want to be an outsider in your community by belong, belonging to a minority religious group. That really makes it difficult for these minority religions to grow rapidly. Now, uh, the podcast today I based on a huge amount of research that's online, and I'm going to link it all below so people can go read it for themselves. Not just articles that I use for this, but also a whole series of books itself. But before we do end this, uh, Don, I, I think it is. Uh, I think I might get to introduce your new book project. You do have a new book that you're finishing up these days. It's way beyond my understanding, so I might get to introduce it to the readers really quickly before we finish this. Okay, I'm working on a translation of a text by a guy named. Tasan Jung Yak Yong, who was a Confucian scholar, one of the greatest in all Korean history, but is also one of the first Catholics. Now, he quit being a Catholic when the government started killing Catholics. The first martyr was his cousin. His own brother was martyred in 1801. Um, he was sent into exile for 18 years. When he was in exile, he didn't have much to do, so he wrote commentaries on the, Confu- on the Confucian classics. But you can see the influence of Christianity in there because he introduced the notion of a personal God into the Confucian classics. And what I'm translating is his commentary on a work called The Doctrine of the Mean, is the usual English translation. And it doesn't mention God at all. But in his commentary, he says, this is all about God. This is all about God. And so it's fascinating seeing this Confucian being influenced by Christian theism and trying to reconcile the two. I call him... Uh, a, a Catholic Confucian. He's more Confucian than Catholic. It's a fascinating work. And again, he's considered one of the greatest thinkers in all Korean history. There's a statue of him on Namsan in Seoul, for example. Uh, he's taught about, all the students learn about him in high school. Uh, the translation has taken me a while because it's about 800 pages with all the footnotes. <laughs> it's, a, uh, uh, it's all written in classical Chinese, of course. Uh, but the whole, I see Tasan as an early pioneer of trying to reconcile traditional Korean beliefs and values with imported notions 
it still creates something that is distinctively Korean. And Tosan is a distinctly Korean thinker, but you can see Christian influence on him. And I hope when the book is finally out in a couple of years that people will find his work as interesting as I do. Well, when the book is out, uh, I'll have to have you back on the podcast to talk it through. It sounds fascinating. Um, so on that, uh, Don Baker, thanks for coming on the Korean Now podcast. Thanks for talking with me. 